take your hymnals with me and turn to hymn number 485. 485, America the Beautiful. Let's go ahead and stand for this one, if you would, please. 485. We thank you that uh, we're allowed to live in America, and uh, most of us here would, would believe that this is one of the greatest countries on this planet, and we're grateful that you've allowed us to live here and to e experience and enjoy all of the blessings that this country has. It's beautiful from a uh, geographic standpoint. Uh, it's diverse from the people standpoint. And Father, we all know that there are issues, and we know that, that uh, it's not perfect. Uh, but yet we're grateful to be here. And I know I, for one, would rather be here than any other uh, country on the planet. And thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here. Pray that you'd help us as citizens to know how to go through the waters that we're going through right now, uh, to be good citizens, to be loving to our neighbors, and uh, to know just how to uh, live out our faith as we do all those things. Thank you, Father. Now bless us today as we uh, turn our hearts toward worshiping you. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to go through a few announcements. First of all, I just want you to know, it's Jim Wilson's fault. He was, he was doing the weed whacking, and he got a little too close to this tree. And uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, we got firewood. Uh, yeah, I was looking at that wondering how much it would do for me. Uh, we, we will probably have to hire a professional to come in and take these down. One of them is uh, leaning toward wires and so forth, so we're going to have to be careful with that. But uh, pray for us that we'd have wisdom on how to get some of those things taken care of. And you notice that we blocked this off. That tree that fell was rotten inside there. The other three that are part of that clump are probably in a very similar state. And if two of them fell, they would go across the driveway here. So we didn't want anyone driving through there. So don't drive around the chairs. Or if you do and you get squashed, uh, we'll be at your funeral. But we, we would rather not do that. Uh, so we've, we've got that blocked off for you. Uh, please uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, I, again, I want to remind you of a couple things with our social distancing. As I'm looking around, you guys are doing well. I appreciate it. Can I stress this? The problem with this whole pandemic thing is that everyone has a different opinion on, on how it works. Uh, you know uh, our governor just 
changed a few rules this last week, which by the way, that happens in every state. They're all struggling with that sort of a thing. And uh, there's people downstate that have had their businesses closed and there's people that think it's good, there's people that think it's bad. It's, 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 and the same thing's true with churches. Uh, I, I got encouraged uh, this last week by uh, a blog from another uh, pastor's group that was just saying for church leadership, uh, maybe you've heard this, and it mentioned all of the different opinions on this, uh, the opinions that say, uh, you guys must not care for anybody, you're not making everyone wear a mask, or, or other people that say, you must not care about the Constitution because you're trying to make us wear a mask, and, and it just it, it's a never-ending thing. So just remember that, that there's lots of different opinions and we're trying to wade through that. Also remember this, um, don't assume that other people around you are okay with you not social distancing with them. Uh, don't go up and give someone a hug. Uh, they might be very friendly and take it, but they may later say, boy, I can't believe they did that. In fact, I heard from someone that this last week that had that very thing happen, and, and it was bothersome to them. And uh, we, we need to just be careful with those things. Um, I know, I know, it's, it's, it's a, a different uh, political landscape that we find ourselves in, but we are there, so we need to be careful. So please, continue to do that, and I am proud of you guys. I'm, I'm proud of the way that you've all been trying to do some of those things, and, and it's been wonderful. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I will remind you that all of our other services, Sunday school, Sunday afternoon, and Wednesday evening prayer meeting, we're not having for now. We're just waiting until the dust settles and we can see our way clear through those things. So uh, uh, pray for us with some of those things. Also remind you that we have our offering baskets back here on the back. If you want to put in your offering as you go or come, please feel free to do that. And there is hand sanitizer all over the place, so feel free uh, to use those things. Now, a couple announcements. Uh, ladies' book study is going to be uh, Saturday, August 1st. So the first Saturday in August would be the next ladies' book study. Uh, Lynn has said she has some extra books, if there's anyone here that doesn't have any. And uh, along with that, she could give you the questions with it. But ladies, it's chapter 2 uh, this time, and it will be here at church. So uh, please keep that in mind. Then, another thing. We have a graduate amongst us. Uh, yay, Katie Snyder. Katie, would you come here for a minute? Would you do that? Um, we have been so glad having your family uh, here with us. I apologize that there's not more young people. You can stay down there. I won't make you come up here. But uh, I apologize that we don't have an active youth group and all that. Our youth group is the Hunts, and they're all in their 40s or whatever. And, uh, and so we apologize for that. But what we have got for you here is, is we got a study Bible. It's an ESV, which is a newer translation, English Standard Version, and it, Whitney uses it and loves it. But it's a study Bible, and almost anything you can read in there is going to have notes to help understand things and kind of see where it's going. So we're giving it to you, hoping that it'll, it'll help increase your faith, it'll help you grow in the Lord. And I know you're going to college, Northern Michigan University, right, up in Marquette. And I uh, hope you enjoy that. It, do you know yet if they've opened up for face-to-face -face classes this fall? Yes. They have for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. So pray for Katie as she goes there. So here you go. Thank you very much. I just thought I should have been wearing my mask, and I wasn't. But uh, sorry about that, Katie. Hmm. We'll, we'll, we'll be good as far as that goes. Uh, all right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on now, and, and we're not going to spend the whole day celebrating the 4th of July. I uh, hope you got a chance to celebrate it yesterday. Uh, we do love our country. Uh, I think all of us here are patriots as far as that is concerned, but uh, we're going to move on and uh, serve the Lord. I saw, I saw an interesting thing uh, this last week. There's a site that I get on Facebook. It's a, it's a Christian site, but it's a satire site. And it, it, the saying was, it showed a, a guy sitting there, and he was, he was like contemplating, had a Bible in, a ha in his hand, and it said, Christian briefly considers trusting in the Lord now that the Supreme Court has let him down again. Do you get the satire in that? Uh, sometimes we think that our government's going to make it right for us. Sometimes we think the Supreme Court's going to make it right for us. Even if they put all conservatives on the Supreme Court, they are not the ones that guarantee our lives are going to be what they're supposed to be. It's the Lord, and we follow the Lord. We love our country. Uh, Canadians should love their country. Brazilians should love their country. Uh, but it's the Lord that we're following. 
And so we're going to continue on doing that. With that in mind, let's sing this song, Across the Lands. You may remain seated. As you do that, by the way, I have to replace some batteries down here. I see that my red light went on, so I'm going to do that while you're singing. But let's sing this song, Across the Lands. how much you've been following it. My uh, online pastors fellowship that I'm at has guys from all over the country. And California this last week made it illegal for churches to sing uh, during their worship services because you're projecting your voice and you're projecting, if you happen to have the virus, you're projecting it farther. And so we understand that. However, there's a huge issue as to can they and can they not do that. Um, especially, for instance, in California, they're encouraging these protests. They're not telling anyone not to shout during the protest. They're not telling anyone not to you know, chant and do their other things that they do during the protest. So the churches are really struggling. Is this just aimed at churches? Why aren't you aiming it at everyone? And actually some of the state Supreme Courts have struck down those things like that. So the churches are trying to decide, since the Lord tells us to sing, especially in regards to worship, is this one of those cases where it's better to obey God than to obey man? And, and you have to figure that out. Is it an o obedience issue or is it not? Well, the only, only reason I'm bringing that up is our governor sometimes follows what some of these other states have to say. So just keep that in mind. We may find ourselves in that situation and we'll have some decisions to make. Uh, so pray about that, if you would. Uh, pray. Uh, actually, the state of Michigan's been pretty good toward churches, so I'm hoping that that continues to happen. But uh, just pray that, uh, that uh, the Lord would give us wisdom as we go through all those things. I'd like you to take your Bible for a moment and turn to Luke chapter 14. This is not the passage I'll be preaching from, but it's a passage that has some related issues with it. Luke chapter 14, I'm going to begin at verse 7. And this is uh, dealing with Jesus having a, a, a confrontation here. So he, meaning Jesus, told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best places, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and, and let's see, and, and he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man. 
And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Now, now our, our wedding feasts don't necessarily do this. There are family tables and stuff like that. But in, in the, the Middle East, uh, this was an issue. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him who invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now let me just say this, Jesus is using what's called hyperbole. And he doesn't mean you can never give a feast or a dinner and invite your own family members and stuff like that. Common in the Middle East, they would overstate something like this to prove their point. So Jesus isn't saying you can't invite all those, but what he is saying is, you need to be considering those that can't repay you. It's not all about getting repaid. It's not about giving a, a social event so that you will be invited to other social events. Uh, that's the idea that Jesus is getting at here. In other words, you need to consider the needs of others, especially those who can't pay you back. So you're not really looking at your own needs, you're looking at their needs. We'll talk about this more as the morning goes on. Let's sing one more song together. Bow the knee. To remember the honeymooners? I, I, knew, I knew I'd get a laugh on that. Most of you know that. Now, frankly, this was, went off the air before I was born. But I saw reruns, so, so I get... Uh, but, there, but the honeymooners, do you remember? There, of course, was Ralph Cramden. Now, you don't have to say it, but do you remember what Ralph Cramden's job was? He was a New York City bus driver. That's right. Uh, Alice Cramden was his wife. And uh, Ed Norton was his friend. Now, do you happen to remember what Ed Norton did? He was a sanitation worker with the sewer. That's right. You guys, you guys are getting all that. Um, now, there's, there's different quotes that you might remember from the honeymooners. But let me just share with you a cartoon that I saw. I, I used to like reading The Far Side. Uh, the guy doesn't make any more anymore, but I still like him. And in The Far Side, there was a shot where these two astronauts 
were walking on the moon and they came up to a skeleton. Now, does that ring any bells to anyone yet? One of them checked it out and said, I think it's Alice Cramden. You, you, remember, you remember the phrase he always said? He always got mad and he said, I'm going to knock you over the moon, right? Uh, something like that. But uh, apparently he didn't make it when he tried it, I suppose. Now, there was a, uh, one of the frequent themes that I remember from the shows that I watched uh, was that he quite often was looking for a get-rich scheme, right? He wanted somehow, some way to uh, make more than what his present income was. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with looking for something, but it was always schemes. And he was looking for schemes, and again, that's okay. I can't remember if he ever was doing anything illegal. And, and, and doing that thing. If he was, that would be an issue. And frankly, that's the direction that I'm going here, is that sometimes in this whole idea of us trying to get rich quick, uh, we can be tempted to do things that we ought not to be doing. Uh, maybe you might not look at it as trying to get rich. Maybe you might look at it as trying to get your fair share. Uh, you know, like, like for instance, uh, not reporting all of your income uh, to the IRS so that you can pay the taxes that you need to pay. Uh, you might think, by the way, that you shouldn't have to pay taxes, but, but the next time another country attacks us and our military goes and defends us, just remember your taxes are there for a reason. Uh, same thing if you call uh, a fire truck to come and put the fire out at your house. Uh, it's, it's a good thing to pay your taxes to be able to get those things done. But sometimes we can be tempted to do wrong things in order to get a little bit more for ourselves. Uh, you might have all kinds of reasoning behind why. You might think it's your due, uh, all of that sort of a thing. But uh, if you're willing to cheat and steal, there's a problem. And Paul is going to... Uh, uh, address that today in the book of Ephesians. Uh, before we get started, let me go to the Lord in prayer. Father, open up all of our hearts as we look at this. Uh, it's easy to look at a passage like this and, and think of other people that are guilty of that. But help each one of us to look into our hearts and see where maybe we're either guilty or we've at least got that mindset that we need to be careful of. Uh, help us, Father. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I am in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, I am going slowly through here because Paul gives us uh, a whole bunch of different topics that we can look at. And I want to look at this one in verse 28. Ephesians 4, verse 28. Paul says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Now, I want to look at this passage in a couple different ways. First of all, I want to remind you that we are in a section that I refer to as the put off, put on section. And it goes back to uh, chapter 4, verses uh, 22 and following. Paul is talking about the fact that uh, we now, we are believers, we're no longer unbelievers, and we need to stop living like unbelievers, ha have our mind changed with biblical thinking, and start living like believers. Let me show you verse 22 of chapter 4. He says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So this is going to be a situation to where we're going to take this verse and put it into this framework to put off, put on. In fact, let me show you what I mean. If you were to look at that and look at those three things, put off, Change your mind, and then put on. Verse 28 works perfectly for that. For, for instance, with the put off, Paul says, steal no longer. We need to put off stealing. Uh, back in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul was listing a list of, of things that people, that unsaved people do, uh, sinful type things, and he says this, he says, nor thieves, nor covetous, and then he goes on to say, and such were some of you, but you were washed. So in other words, some of these believers he's talking to used to be thieves or covetous or any of the other things that were in that list that he's mentioned. But he says, you were that way, but now you've been washed. And the verse goes on and says sanctified and so forth. Uh, you've been made a new person in Jesus Christ. So the put off part, put off, steal no longer. We're going to look at that more in a little bit. And then the renewed thinking where he says in verse 23 to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Uh, what is the renewed thinking here? And the renewed thinking that we as believers should develop is that labor with your own hands doing what is good. 
You need to understand that labor is a good thing. You also need to understand that whatever labor you choose to, choose to do needs to be a good thing as well. But he says you need to earn your keep. You need to do uh, work, and work is a good thing according to the scriptures, and you need to do, of course, what's morally upright as you do the work. Just earning money doesn't qualify for a biblically based idea. We'll look at that as it goes on. And then to put on. We did to put off, renewed the thinking that labor is good, and now what you need to put on is that you do all that so that you can have something to give. Notice the change that Paul says in verse 28. You need to change from selfish getting to unselfish giving. And, and we're going to look at that as it goes. So you need to be meeting needs. In other words, whether it's the needs of your own family or even beyond that, how you would have the funds to meet those things. Now, let's look at the biblical pattern with all of that as we, as we talk about the put off, put on. I want you to really know as I was putting this together, I, I wanted to really make sure we see that this is something that the Bible is saying. This is not something that just, well, that's Pastor Wagner's opinion on the matter. This is not something that, well, that's the way Baptists do it. Uh, and, and that's not the idea. I, I really want to demonstrate the idea that these things are stated in Scripture multiple times. So we are going to be looking at several different passages as we go through this. And, and I'll show you what I mean. Let's begin with the first thing, the stealing. He said we need to put off stealing. Uh, does the Bible say anything about stealing? Well, you know it does. You go right back to the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not steal. Uh, and that's in Exodus chapter 20. Now, I believe that there's a number of reasons for that in, in the Ten Commandments. I do not believe that the Ten Commandments are necessarily private rules for someone to live by. Although, although they are good rules for us to live by. But what it was originally intended for, God was giving Israel their law. And he was telling them, you as a country, you as a society need to live this way. And all those things put together helped their society be what God was intending it to be. The first four of the Ten Commandments had to do with you relating to God. And the last six of the Ten Commandments had to do with you relating to each other. And of course the one we're uh, interested in today is you shall not steal. And uh, so in order for your society to work right... This needs to be one of the moral frameworks that we operate by, okay? Now, I'm just as a side note, I believe it does also prove the idea that private ownership is important. I, believe, I, I, I don't see in the Bible where we're told to become some kind of a commune where everything you make is thrown in the pot and then everybody shares. I'm not saying you can't do that if you wanted to do that. But I am saying that, that no one can take the scriptures and prove that that's the way it has to be done. Uh, private ownership is always backed up in the scriptures. People are told to share, they're never forced to share. Okay, So that's just that's my little political moment for the day, I guess. But the private ownership is upheld. Now in the New Testament, Jesus and Paul both quote this ten, these Ten Commandments. And they both quote the idea of you shall not steal. And then Paul even goes more explicit in talking about stealing, especially here in Ephesians and in a couple other places. But he's going to talk about the idea that you shouldn't be stealing. Now, I know that we all know this, right? But, but I wanted to make sure that we looked at the idea that the Bible does back that up. Look at this from Proverbs chapter 13. By the way, the book of Proverbs has a bunch of them if you wanted to go through the book of Proverbs. But Proverbs 13.11 says, Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished. But he who gathers by labor will increase. And that brings us to the next point that Paul was getting at. And that's, he talks about labor. What does the Bible have to say about labor, about work? Now work is given a high place in the scriptures. You will find that work is honorable in the scriptures. Um, go back, you don't have to turn there, but in your mind, go back to Genesis chapter 2. In the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, when uh, the, God had placed Adam into the garden, he gave him work to do. Now, you might be saying, oh, but pastor, that's because of the curse. When the curse came, now we have to work and we have to labor. No, this is before the curse came. Work was a part of the existence. Work, in other words, was exactly what God designed. If you want to go back and say, what is God's design for us, for us to really enjoy life and to be fulfilled in life, well, work is a part of that. So work is a, is a good thing. 
work, labor, and, and that takes so many different forms, right? It, it can be done in so many different ways, but still, work is a good thing. It's God's design. That was before sin. Now, after sin, uh, when you get into Genesis 3, uh, God says, now your labor is going to become miserable. Because you're going to plant and yet thorns and thistles are going to grow up. That kind of stuff. But, but that still doesn't negate the fact that work is not a part of the curse. Work was given before then as a blessing. So keep that in mind. I want to go and look at the church in Thessalonica. Okay, we're going to, we're going to actually turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. If you uh, want to turn there. They're actually just beyond Ephesians, a couple books. Uh, to get to those. But let me give you a little bit of context about Thessalonica. If you'll remember in Thessalonica that after Paul and his group came and preached the gospel and established the church, persecution arose. In fact, it arose after Paul left. And they started persecuting the believers there. You might remember the story in Acts where they came to a, a person's house named Jason. And he was actually a part of the church. And they pulled him out and, and they, were, they, were, they were, it was like a mob action is what it was. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't hurt him at the time, but they put pressure on him. They took a pledge from him and so forth that they would, they would be good, that kind of a thing. And so they were being persecuted in Thessalonica. Well, we find out from reading Paul's letters that uh, the church decided they needed to help each other because they were under persecution. And so the church is doing things to help each other. They never, never do you see where they were forced. All right, everybody put your money in a pot and we'll divvy it out. You don't get that at all. What you do get is that the believers of the church were deciding to help one another. And you certainly see that. However, because of that, a problem arose. Apparently, there were some people in the congregation that decided, wow, everybody's helping. I'm, I'm going to quit working. And they did. They quit working and they were living on the goodness of their fellow believers trying to help them. And that created a real problem. Now you would think that, that through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would tell Paul, go tell that church, you, you guys work and quit whining and support all these people. They need your help, right? That's not at all what happened. What happened is the ones who decided to quit working and live off the goodness of everyone else, they're going to get in trouble. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I am going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, first, first Thessalonians, I meant. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading at verse 9. Paul says, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And by the way, he's talking about helping to support each other here in, in context. He's not just talking about having love for each other and hugging each other when you're at church or shaking hands. He's talking about actually helping to care for each other's physical needs because of the persecution. Let me keep going. And he says, And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. In other words, keep doing it. Keep on keeping on. That you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. In other words, you need, you need to be working so that you have a good testimony to the people who are outside watching, and, and, and also that your needs are met. So right here is just a general idea. He's telling them, you need to work. You need to be working and keep doing that. Now we go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul has to write back again because some of these people didn't get the message. I mean, they probably heard it, but they didn't obey it. And they're still struggling with this whole thing. And he's going to tell them this is a serious problem. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading in verse 6. He says, but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the traditions which he received from us. Now, what's he talking about disorderly? Is he talking about the immoral people? Is he talking about drug dealers? No, he's talking about guys that aren't working, that, that, are, that are trying to sponge off of the rest of the group. He says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority. In other words, he was an apostle. He could have accepted a wage, but he was trying to set an example. But to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. 
Now, Paul's not just saying, hey, let's love everybody, man. Let's just give it, hand it out to them, dish it. No, he's saying, if these guys, and he's talking about within the church, if they won't work, they're not going to eat either. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Now, I bring all that up to point out the idea that Paul is saying work is good. And work is what is, what is needed. And you need to be doing that and taking care of those. In fact, he goes on in the next couple of verses. It's so serious. He tells them, if they won't do it, we need to do church discipline on these people. Because they ought not to be doing that. Work is good. Now, keep in mind, we understand that there are some people who can't work. And we're going to look at some passages later that deal with that. And those people truly do need help. But Paul is not, is not advocating that we set up some kind of a welfare system so people don't have to work. No, those who can should. They need to be doing that. I was, I was uh, reading from a pastor recently. He had been a missionary, and I think it was in Thailand. And he said it was so interesting because he said, you go over in Thailand, and he said, these families take care of each other, and they've got, they've got elderly people living in their homes. He said, but what was really interesting is that the elderly people were finding ways to work and contribute to the family also. And, and they, they were doing those things. Now, uh, again, sometimes there's times when they can't. But when they could, they would. And uh, that, was a, that was a wonderful thing. I think they understood the idea of work. Now Paul also goes on to say that uh, your work needs to be good. He says, do your work in that that is good. And, and all I mean by that is, in other words, it doesn't mean that you can take up some sort of work that is immoral or some sort of work that is furthering some sort of sin, that kind of a thing. Uh, we won't turn there, but in Acts chapter 19, there's a situation where uh, people were preached the gospel, and a bunch of people turned to the Lord in salvation. And in this particular city, they were practicing all kinds of witchcraft and stuff like that. And that's where you get the story that these people who turned to the Lord brought the books that they used to practice that witchcraft, and they bought and they burnt the books. Now... I know burning books sounds bad, and, and, and I'm not advocating that we go to the library in town and burn any book that has stuff that we don't like. And not like but these people were using the witchcraft as their income, and now they had decided we're not going to make our income that way, and they burnt their own books. They weren't burning other people's books. They burnt their own books so that they would not be doing that anymore. And, and, and my point is... They, they, they knew, needed to work, they needed to provide an income for themselves, but they did not want to do it in a way that dishonored God. So they did work that was good. All right, so we see a couple things here. Uh, we see that he's talking about labor, that labor is a good thing. We, we see that the scriptures talk about uh, stealing and that we ought not to be stealing. Uh, what about this whole idea of that change of mind? Once your mind's been changed and now you want to be able to work so that you can give to those who are in need. Okay? Let me, let me just read a couple passages here for you. I am in 1 Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And Paul is talking to the rich people. They were just like in our society. In, in, in any church, you're going to have people that are on the lower end of the spectrum. You're going to have people that are higher on the financial end of the spectrum. You're going to have all that. And of course, in their societies, it was a little more pronounced even so than it is here in ours. But still, here's what Paul says. Uh, he's telling Timothy this, to say this in the churches where you are working as a pastor. He says, verse 17 of chapter 6, Command those who are rich in the present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy let them do good that they be rich in good works ready to give willing to share storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life now he's not saying they're going to get eternal life by giving you, you can't earn eternal life but he's saying you know when you get into eternal life the Lord is going to reward us in different ways but he's telling them that you need to be ready to give did you notice he's not saying the rest of you need to go and take the money away from the rich people so that you can spread it out to everyone else by the way Robin Hood is never praised in the scriptures uh, that sort of a lifestyle. Steal from the rich and give to the poor. It's just, it's not. In fact, things like this would go against that. But he's encouraging the rich to have that mindset and to have that spirit. Uh, so that's from 1 uh, Timothy 6. 
In uh, Romans chapter 12, you don't need to turn there, but Paul is listing a bunch of things that he's telling the Christians, these are good things, live like this, live like this, do these things. And one of the things he said is, you need to be distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. Um, my personal opinion, I, I, I do believe that we need, to be, we need to be helpful, especially in our communities, we need to be helpful. But by and large, most of the times in the scriptures where you see them providing for the needs of others, it's almost always within the church community because they're caring for their own. And that's first and foremost. Now, can they do other things for others? Yes, you would even see it from time to time. Uh, but that's not the primary emphasis. The primary emphasis is taking care of the needs even within the church body. And of course, back then they were in situations where there were all kinds of needs like that. And we're going to look at, at one of those situations in just a minute. Uh, I already read Luke chapter 14 where Jesus talks about when you're giving this feast. You, you need to be someone who is willing to give, is willing to share, willing to do things for the sake of others. And, and I want to demonstrate a little bit. I want to look at this selfless pattern that, that uh, is being pushed here by Paul as well as the Lord Jesus. Uh, if you would, turn to Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, uh, I, want, I want you to ask this question. How is Paul living this out? How is Paul uh, applying this lesson to himself? That we need to put away stealing. We need to understand that God says labor is good. And then we need to labor so that we can give to others who are in need. Uh, and so forth. How is Paul going to actually apply that? Well, if you're in Acts chapter 20... What's interesting about this is that Paul is actually talking to the Ephesian elders. Paul is on another missionary journey. He's not in Ephesus, but he was passing close by. He's on his way back to Jerusalem. And I think Paul knew that he was going to face severe persecution when he gets back there. So as he come near to there, he called uh, for the Ephesian church leaders to come down and meet him at the city where his ship was docking. And so they came down there and Paul addresses them. And he talks about a lot of different things uh, during his uh, message to them. But I want to look at verse 33 of Acts chapter 20. In uh, verse 33, he says, well, let me go back to verse uh, 32 just to stay in the paragraph. So now, brethren, I command you, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You see? You see the mindset there? And Paul's got that mindset. Now, Paul would never say that a pastor or one of the other apostles should not receive an income from their ministry. In fact, he argues the exact opposite. Remember he quotes the saying that says, do not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. That's an Old Testament proverb. And he uses that in a situation that people who are in ministry can, can get paid. And, and that's not an issue. But Paul didn't want to do that. He was a tent maker. He wanted to do these things and supply his need because he was trying to change a mindset in their community there. And, and that's what he was doing. Uh, at any rate, he tells them, I wasn't coveting these things, these things. In other words, I was helping people, the people with me, and, and I want you guys to follow that same example. Where there's people who need help, please help them. I want to look at one last one here. Uh, in 1 Timothy, if you'll turn to 1 Timothy 5. This is, this is an important situation because Paul's going to show, this is after all this, he's right into Timothy, and he's going to show Timothy how to apply it in their situation. Now let me give you a little bit of context here. Timothy was pastoring different churches that Paul had him in. Paul sent him to pastor some to set up leadership and train people and so forth. And when Timothy was pastoring where he was, one of the situations they had in their culture was that Widows really had it rough. You know, they didn't have the welfare programs. They didn't have the, the other government type uh, programs to help. And, and so there were people who would fall through the cracks, especially if you're a widow without family. If uh, your husband had passed away, maybe your children had passed away, and in their health care situation back then, it wasn't unusual to have your children pass away before you. But there were some that were left, and they couldn't work, 
and they were in a male-dominated society that prevented them from doing a lot of different things. So it was difficult on them. And the churches decided they had to care for those people in their midst that were really struggling in that way. And if you read in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, chapter 6 and following, uh, you'll see where a lot of that happens. And Paul actually lays out, um, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul actually lays out uh, instructions for them on who you should support, who you shouldn't support. And by the way, it wasn't a welfare thing again. He didn't say, just help everybody that has needs. No, he actually had some stipulations there that they needed to follow to be put on the widow's list, if you want to call it that. But I want to show you a couple of things that he says. Look in uh, chapter 5, verse 8. Paul says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Paul is telling him, look, we've got this list. We're caring for these widows. But if you as a family have widows in your family, don't push them off on the church and say, look, the church will give you an income. They'll, they'll provide a stipend for you. No, he's saying don't do it. If you're not providing for your own, you're worse than an unbeliever, he says. And then go to verse 16. He says, if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. And do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. You see the whole idea? In our country, we tend to have the mindset that says, look, if there's a way to get money, get it and go for it. You know, and I understand if you're entitled to it, okay, you're entitled to it. But we need to watch what is that mindset. Is it a selfish mindset that's just getting what I can get? Or is it a mindset to where, okay, if I need it, that's one thing. But if I can provide it, I'm going to provide it. And Paul's here telling them, look, don't push your widows off on the church. You take care of them. If they're your family members, your aunt, your grandma, your mom, your great-grandma, whoever it would be, you help take care of them. And don't burden the church in order to be able to do it. So you see the mindset? It's this whole mindset that Paul is getting at here. Is that when you go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and it says uh, you need to stop stealing, uh, you need to work, and you need to provide for even those who have need. The, the mindset is you need to change from a selfish mindset to a selfless mindset. You need to help take care of those others. You need, you need to, in fact, even when you think about working and you think about the income you're generating, you need to think about it in such a way that how can this help? Who can this help? Yes, it's going to help me. Yes, I take care of my wife and children. Uh, yes, I take care of, of our family members. Yes, I even help take care of a neighbor once in a while when they need it. You, you see the mindset difference? Uh, it, it's a real mindset difference where you're, you're thinking about helping rather than getting. That's, that's the most important thing. <clears throat> Obviously, you have to get to be able to help, but you're getting for the right reasons. And that's the idea here. So as we look at this, we need to remember that we need to put away stealing in all of its forms. And we're not even going to go through that. You can figure out a lot of different ways that we might be doing that. You need to have godly thinking that says work is good. Work is good. And then you need to put on Christian love. Caring for the needs of others. Family, of course. Uh, extended family. Uh, fellow believers. Even your neighbors. But we need to have the mindset that we're helping rather than just getting. You know what I mean? That's the idea. That's what Paul's saying. If we're going to put off the old man and put on the new man, uh, we need to put off the scraping to get and put on the earning to give. We need to have that mindset as believers. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, working in our hearts. Those of us here who know the Lord Jesus as our Savior, uh, we're so grateful that you've worked in our hearts and you've changed us. Uh, help us now, Lord, to walk worthy of that calling that you put upon us. Help us to put off the old ideas of living the way the world does and put on the new ideas of living the way you want us to. Uh, may we be a blessing to those around us. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing one more song together. Number 54, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You may remain seated. 54.
Great idea, Don. A little acapella is a good thing. I'd like to invite these folks here, if you may get ready and go, and then once they're out, we will dismiss everyone else. May the Lord bless your afternoon.